congratulations, Sai, for such a tremendous work. Uh, there's very little left to be said on the subject. It is so comprehensive. But since I'm a historian, and there's such a large, young audience over here, I would like to place certain issues before them, which will help in clarifying the situation. You know, you've talked about Middle Eastern coloniality. My study of history shows me that this Middle Eastern coloniality had its advent in India at the moment the first Muslim state was set up, that is the Delhi Sultanate in 1206. And I'm just going to make five, six points about Middle Eastern coloniality vis-a-vis -vis the political setup, vis-a-vis -vis the economic setup, vis-a-vis -vis the language setup, and vis-a-vis -vis the cultural setup. So just uh, be a little patient. Uh, when the Sultanate was established in 1206, the entire cabinet consisted of among 40 Turks. So this was such a closed political system. And this remained a closed system till the time of the Khaljis, when there was a revolt and a new batch of people came from Khalaj in Afghanistan. So that is the next thing. And in the time of the Sayyids, about 22 Afghan families shared all the political posts among themselves. So Middle Eastern coloniality, as far as the political setup in Delhi is concerned, begins with the advent of the first Muslim state in India. Now, I'll just quickly come to the Mughals. Babur, when he came to India, he brought with him two groups of people. One were the Iranis from Iran, and the other were the Central Asians or Turanis. The entire ministry was dominated only by these two groups. There was no question of accommodating or giving space to any Indian Muslim or Rajput or whoever. Humayun, he was exiled. When he came back, he came with more foreign groups and they controlled the polity. Things began to change in the time of Akbar because, you know, he was a young boy and he was all the time threatened with revolts by other foreign groups who said we are from more distinguished families, why should we not sit on the throne of Hindustan? That is when Akbar realized that all the weight is on, of the scales is on one side, Taraju, and we must have some weight on the other side. So the intelligent person that he was, he chose two groups. One is the Rajputs and the other is the Indian Muslims. Indian Muslims because no foreign Muslim is going to choose them as their leader and Rajputs because they were sword arm of Hindu society. So the composition of the ruling class in the Mughal period remained 70% foreign born Muslims and 30%, 15% Rajputs and 15% uh, Indian Muslims. This remained unchanged, virtually unchanged till the reign of Aurangzeb and why it remained unchanged, we can discuss that later. But when the Mughal Empire went into decline, this is very, very surprising. It talks about coloniality. The Mughal emperor had to appoint governors at three important provinces of India, Awadh, which we call UP today, Bengal, and Hyderabad. And whom did he appoint in Awadh? An Iranian who had come to India in 1708 and in 1722 was made in charge of the important province of Awadh. And after that, we know what happened in Awadh. The same thing in Bengal. It's interesting because in Bengal, there was a young Brahmin boy in the Deccan and one Iranian nobleman adopted him, converted him to his faith and he served in various posts in the Mughal Empire. Then this Iranian went back to Iran and when he died, this convert Muslim came to India in 1699. In 1700, Aurangzeb appointed him governor of the Deccan. There is no question, I mean, this coloniality, people are coming in the 18th century and getting the top post. And in Hyderabad, the person who was appointed governor, his father had come in the time of Shah Jahan, and they said, we are the descendants of Abu Bakr, the caliph. 
So this mindset continues. This is just one aspect. Then I want to talk about the economic coloniality. You see, in the Mughal state, the entire revenue was coming from agriculture. In the Hindu system, it was that the ruler should tax the peasant as much as a bee extracts honey from a flower, it should not hurt that flower. But in the Mughal state, the land tax was almost the entire produce of the peasant. And we have so many foreign travelers coming and discussing and describing the state of the peasantry and the peasantry are exploited. They try to run away from their fields. The Mughal state tries to bring them back. But that apart, this entire surplus of the countryside, it was distributed in the Mughal state among 1,600 people only. The entire surplus was distributed among 1,600 people. And as we've discussed, they were relatives of the emperor, foreign nobility, etc. And this nobility, they, each member of the nobility or the ruling class had to keep soldiers for the state. Even if you were a writer like Abul Fazl, you had to keep a minimum number of soldiers for the state. So, 1600 people, they spent 50% of their income on maintaining the troops. And Akbar spent another 10% on maintaining the troops. That means 60% of the resources of the empire were spent on maintaining an armed force at a time when India faced no external threat. So what, this is coloniality, and we talk about the British, they took away. This was just conspicuous consumption. The village got nothing in return. So that is the second point. Now to come to the cultural point. Akbar, whom we refer so much, he was the first person who said Persian will be the language of administration at all levels. And even the village Patwari who kept the revenue records had to learn Persian. Now how do you overnight learn Persian? Akbar first of all imported many Iranians from Iran and he revised the madrasa curriculum so that Khatris and Kayas could learn the language fast. So this is uh, when we talk, you know, when we compare uh, Middle Eastern coloniality with the British, this is an important aspect which we have not paid attention to. Now, when, so that means Persian derived its power only from the state. When the Mughal Empire went into decline, that Persian language did not have the support of the state. So what was the alternative? A new language had to be devised. The natural language that should have been chosen was Hindavi. It was the naturally evolving language. But what was the problem in Hindavi? It was that it had a large number of Sanskrit words. So the Mughal uh, intellectual class, they removed Sanskrit words, substituted them for Arab and Persian words, and that gave birth to Urdu. The Mughals never patronized a native language. And uh, in this context, I just want to make one point. You know, they had Sanskrit scholars who would come to the court, but in the Persian records, they're never mentioned as Sanskrit scholars. They're only mentioned as singers who came to the court, sang before the emperor, and took money and went away in the most derogatory manner. And Last point, and after that I'll just make one more point, architecture. It was the rule in the Mughal period that every lane, by-lane highway should be dominated only by mosques. And the religious structures of every other site, were, of every other group were pushed away from public view. Man Singh, who was a friend of Akbar, he was made governor of Rotas. And in Rotas, he bought a lot of land. He wanted to build a big temple there. Then this friend of the emperor, he gets frightened that if I build a temple over here, emperor will get angry. So he, Man Singh, builds a mosque over there and the small temple at the side. In his home state of Ambar, 
he wanted to build the Jagat Shrimani temple in honor of his young son who had passed away. And again, it is in the back lane. If you're passing through that road, you will not even know that there's a temple there. So this, you know, this coloniality that you just brush aside, this is such a painful uh, part of our history. And we talk about uh, Mughal Rajput marriage alliances as a Ganga Jamna Tehzeeb. The Mughals always prided themselves in their Turkic ancestry. They said we are the descendants of Timur. They've never mentioned their that Rajput blood also flow on their veins. And this is a story that we find on both sides. The Rajput texts that were written in the medieval period, they did not mention the alliances, marriage alliances with Mughals. And Mughals did not mention the marriage alliances with the Rajputs. Uh, Man Singh in, and all the Rajput rulers, one point that I want to make, all the Rajput rulers who became part of the Mughal system each of them was very worried that how will posterity remember us. So in their own kingdoms, they got their court historians to present their view of the Mughal Rajput alliance. So uh, uh, Man Charit, Mughal um, uh, uh, history that was written in Man Singh's court, does not mention that his grandfather gave a daughter in marriage to Akbar. So, you know, it, I mean, to say that it was Ganga Jamna Tezib, it is to ignore what a contested memory we have of that period. And, uh, you know, so-called uh, secular intellectuals, they are just trying to whitewash this painful episode of our past. This is something, a series of histories were written in every Rajput court contesting what the Mughals were presenting at this thing. So, you know, uh, I mean, I'll stop over here, but it is important to remember this counter narrative when we talk about coloniality. And uh, Sai has made a very, very important contribution to Middle Eastern coloniality. But I think that these kind of facets, they will help the younger generation to argue. You did not uh, allow Hindavi, you imposed Persian. With Persian, you impose a Persian culture, a Persian language, a Persian tradition. So, you know, and you never gave representation to anyone. And uh, Jagannath Pandit, he was a very, very renowned scholar. And uh, he is never referred to as a, we would not know that he was a Sanskrit scholar if we referred to only the Persian texts, you know. And just last point, that this whole debate about jazia and pilgrimage tax, this also needs to be re-examined. In the time of Shah Jahan, there was a very important Sanskrit scholar, uh, Kabindacharya. He came to Shah Jahan's court and successfully made the emperor remove the pilgrimage tax to all Hindus going on pilgrimage to Prayag and Alaba. Now, if Akbar had removed the thing and that had become effective, why did these people have to come to Shah Jahan? And in the Mughal Persian accounts, this is not mentioned at all, that Shah Jahan removed this tax because Shah Jahan was very conscious of his image as a proud, good Muslim. So, you know, and we know about this only because the Hindu writers, they felicitated him and they honored him. But there are two contrasting worldviews and two contrasting thought traditions that are existing side by side in the entire medieval period. And I have not found any evidence of them uh, meeting each other. Thank you. <laughs>